Chapter 3 On the Campaign Trail As the weeks passed, Harry made several speeches and Hermione answered a lot of questions. A team of journalists surfaced and they went to every press conference. After classes every day, Harry and Ron were campaigning. With his firebolt, Ron was the best player at his Quidditch practices. Once the season starts, he'll definitely be very popular around the school. I'm such a great candidate that no one is running against me, Harry exclaimed one afternoon just before an announcement. No one's running against you because the position doesn't exist, nor does this election, Hermione retorted. The voters seem to disagree. Have you seen my polling data? Oh yes, great job. You managed to trick a bunch of gits into believing something that doesn't exist. Hagrid's been doing that for years. Think what you want, Mud, but today I'm going to announce the Harry Potter political party. The party for citizens who want me to be king. That's not how parties work, Hermione said. Mud, I know you've never been to a party before and this is tough for you. You're my best friend and I'd be happy to invite you. Invite me to what? To join the Harry Potter political party party, of course. Before Hermione could express the stupidity of Harry's latest sentence, Ron joined them. I've got the results of the survey. A growing worry is about the larcenies at Hogwarts. Larceny? Awesome, Harry exclaimed. I can talk about my heartfelt experience and personal attachment to stopping theft of any kind. I guess something good did come from Rock's kidnapping. Thank you, Ron. I'll save that for a later speech. But how are you going to stop it? Hermione asked. There are great thieves in this castle. Some of them are professional. I'm the protector of Hogwarts. I'll figure something out, Harry said. A larceny. <laughs> Mad-Eye Moody was standing behind them with his usual flask. I used to be a bobby, you know. Stopped all them criminals. How long have you been standing there? Hermione asked. Hee-hee, <laughs> larceny was me middle name. Or was it stopping larceny? Arg, it don't matter. Harry tried to subtly push Mad-Eye Moody away, while Ron gave another disgusted glare. Soon the professor was stumbling towards the castle. After a little more preparation, Harry took the podium. Hello, citizens. It is I, Harry Potter, protector of Hogwarts. Hello, citizens. It is I, Harry Potter, protector of Hogwarts and candidate for the King of Hogwarts election. First, I'd like to introduce something my staff and I have worked very hard on, the Harry Potter political party. If you want me to be the King of Hogwarts, then sign up today. It's also a party for people who believe in heroism. Not heroism, but heroism. The belief of heroes and my personal religion. The crowd cheered. He does think he's the Pope, Hermione said quietly. When you sign up, you will be put on the entrance list to the Join the Harry Potter Political Party party. The door prize is a free Nimbus 2000. Three brand new firebolts will be raffled off as well. All prizes were provided by Sir Ron Weasley III Esquire. The event will take place in the cafeteria on Saturday, October 1st. Harry stepped down from the wooden stage that had been made by volunteers. Before the crowd could divide, someone else took the podium. Harry looked back and saw Draco Malfoy. He looked as smug as ever with a hint of evil. His blonde, slicked-back hair looked neater than ever. Friends. I have decided to run for King of Hogwarts. I will defeat the incompetent clown that has dubbed himself Protector of Hogwarts. Do not be fooled by his lofty promises. Underneath it all is a selfish desire and a hideous secret. No one cheered. However, they didn't boo either. Throughout Hogwarts Castle, the election was the only topic. More and more rumors spread with the help of Hogwarts' newest tabloid, The Fictum Post, led by Colin Creevy, a small third-year Gryffindor. Reporters and photographers popped up everywhere. They hid in bushes, trees, closets, bathrooms, vents, cabinets. They even made secret passageways. Some disguised themselves as gargoyles, and a few started to hide on the roof. Malfoy won over many students. Harry still had the majority of the voters, but he was getting worried. We gotta show them you mean business, Ron said before one safety started. How? Harry asked. Hermione responded with flames in her eyes. By making some progress before you win. By promising more changes and improvements. By giving away more free stuff. Her words were quiet so no one but Ron and Harry could hear, but her tone still told them she was shouting. I had the impression you thought the election was stupid, Ron said. That was before Malfoy started running. Now we have to win. Especially since he would be a terrible king. The door fell open and Mad-Eye Moody crawled in with his flask. Students peered over their desks to watch him move across the floor. Hello, he exclaimed before climbing onto his seat. I got a lesson today. I darn deed found it on the bottom of their, their filing cabinet. He didn't point to a filing cabinet. He didn't point to anything. But first, where's me juice? Assuming he meant his flask, the students pointed to his hand. Oh, there it is. 
Um, Neville Longbottom started. Are you allowed to drink while teaching? Mad-Eye Moody looked at the flask like it had just transformed into a duck. This is, a uh, polyjuice potion. I'm, um, not the real Mad-Eye Moody? A long silence ensued, but finally he began the lesson. Now look at this balloon. It's full of helium. I got to borrow this. He took Harry's wand and started waving it around. If you're not careful, the sharp wand popped the balloon. That'll happen, and if the balloon belongs to a small child, then his parents will never forgive you. It's unforgivable. Personally, I think they're overreacting, but I guess us parent and another unforgivable act that I won't, will, won't demonstrate happens when you stab a person with a wand. Trust me, they won't find it funny. Then you get a long sentence in Azkaban. Luckily, there was a prison break last year. Each student inched away from him in their chair. Their final unforgivable act I'll teach you about is about one point. When you have someone at one point, they will pretty much do it anything you say. It's really great. Oh, very illegal. Now I'll have you spend the rest of the class bubble wrapping your wand. Another boring session of the sounds of bubble wrapping began and led everyone to look at anything that wasn't bubble wrap. Eyes wandered around the room and out the window. Harry's eyes caught something strange. Neville Longbottom was wearing a black earpiece. He pointed it out to Ron and Hermione, who put on the same confused expression Harry was wearing. After scrambling out of the class, Harry, Ron, and Hermione started to feel as though everyone was whispering about them as they walked through the halls. The feeling only grew as they came closer to a victim post booth. When they approached the tabloid booth, they saw their faces on the cover of the most recent edition. The headline read, Harry Potter slanders best friend using racial slurs. What? No, I didn't, Harry insisted. They quickly bought one as everyone treated them like goldfish in a bowl. Hermione flipped through the pages while they ran into a vacant classroom. Alleged protector of Hogwarts Harry Potter candidate for the King of Hogwarts election has brought attention to the politically incorrect word mudblood, a derogatory slur meaning a wizard who has been born into a non-wizarding family. Hermione looked up from the newspaper. So that's what it means. Yes, now keep reading, Ron said impatiently. He consistently refers to his best friend, Hermione Granger, as Mud. An anonymous whistleblower has informed us that the nickname is derived from the slur, Mudblood. We can conclude that Harry Potter not only hates Muggleborns, but he also believes that he can do the very things he tells others not to do. Do not give Harry Potter your vote, you have another choice. Draco Malfoy is a much better candidate, while many people are even calling for the expulsion of Harry Potter, the destroyer of Hogwarts? Hermione dropped the newspaper into a garbage can. This is mad. I bet no one believes this propaganda. Everyone believes it, Harry said bluntly. You saw how they were looking at us. Or rather me. They hate me. That's not true, Ron said. We've just got to prove them wrong. We can turn things around. Plenty of politicians have scandals. And this one's not even true, Hermione added. Yes, it is. I do call you a mudblood. I just needed another talking point, so I decided to make it politically incorrect. We should probably drop it, Ron suggested, but there are a lot more problems you can fix. And there's a ton of things you can do to restore the students' opinions of you, Hermione said. After classes, they went to the biggest bulletin board in the castle looking for jobs that would win back some students. The beige bulletin board was comically large. Every inch was covered with paper, and the few places the wooden frame peeked through were the only indicators that the board was beige. Most of the bulletins were white, but there were a couple notes that were on colored paper. The weight of the bulletins had been pulling the board away from the wall, making a lot of people avoid it on their routes around the castle. Whenever a large group of people walked by, the board shook. Sometimes they could even hear the wall cracking. Notes often fell off the bulletin board and were kicked around the hallway until the caretaker, Argus Filch, picked them up. The reason that the bulletin board had so much clutter was because nothing was ever unpinned. Old notes were forgotten and eventually covered by new notes. They stared at the monster for a moment and then started to sift through the notes. Ron took the left side of the board, Harry took the right side, and Hermione took the middle. The sound of shuffling paper echoed through the long, vacant corridor. Ron ripped off several layers toward the floor and looked at one of the dusty, rediscovered notes. This one's from 16 years ago. What does it say? Harry asked. I hope Filch has to pick up this note, Ron read. Me too, whoever you are. He unpinned the bulletin and dropped it on the ground. Oh look, it's a missing rock flyer. Harry said. He got a marker from his bag and wrote, found. He put the marker back and admired the flyer. I think I'll leave it there for posterity. Some of these are so dusty, Hermione said as she wiped her hands together. Loud footsteps began to mix with the sound of paper. Harry looked back and saw that the footsteps belonged to Hagrid. Hello, Hagrid, Harry greeted. Hermione and Ron turned and saw Hagrid waving as he walked closer to them. Thinking about joining a club? Hagrid asked. 
No, I'm already on the Quidditch team, Ron said. And I'm running for King of Hogwarts, Harry reminded. And I don't want to support the school, Hermione admitted before giving Hagrid an answer. The victim post published an exaggerated article about Harry that worried a lot of his supporters, Hermione explained. I read about that this morning. Of course, I knew he wasn't offending you. You still have me vote. You read the victim post? Ron asked. I like the crosswords. I'm trying to do the difficult one without looking at the answer key. We're trying to find things that will restore the students' trust in Harry, Hermione said. I've got just the thing, Hagrid said as he took a folded paper out of his pocket. The Yule Ball. It only comes around once every four years. As always, I'm in charge. It'd be great if I had some help. Definitely, Harry decided. I always remember it's the Yule Ball year because it's the same year as the Triwizard Tournament and Dumbledore's always making a big deal about it. What's the Triwizard Tournament? Hermione asked. It's a big competition. Students around Hogwarts compete to win fame and glory. That would help with the election. Do I have a shot? Harry asked. Well, you're a fourth year, meaning you're 14. Seeing as the minimum age requirement is 17, no. It's too dangerous. But it could really help, Harry whined. Hagrid shook his head. Sorry, Harry, but I'd like you to not die. He pinned the Yule Ball flyer on the bulletin board. I'd better be off. I'll send a note with Hedwig after tomorrow's lesson with some details about what I need help with. You still train him? Ron asked. Hedwig's a very smart bird, Hagrid replied as he walked away. I wonder if he could train Pig, Ron said. Maybe teach him to be more calm. I don't think anyone could teach him that, Hermione said. As they walked back to Gryffindor Tower, they noticed the non-political posters for the first time. Right beside a vote for Harry Potter and get a free pointy hat poster was an Enter the Triwizard Tournament Today poster. All you need is a fake ID, Ron said. Then you'll be 17. And where would he get a fake ID? Hermione asked. Ron laughed. Do you even have to ask? I know a guy. He can get me a cheap and very fake ID. I might know someone who can get me a free fake ID, Hermione said quietly. What? Harry asked in surprise. Mud, why would you know someone like that? You can't go back to a life of crime. Actually, Hermione started, I know several people who can get me a free fake ID. I'm jealous of your sources, Ron said. If you promise you'll be very careful, I can get you one, Hermione said. Fine, if it's the only way to become the king. I feel like this would be a huge scandal if it gets out, Ron warned. The next day, Harry waited in the common room for Hedwig. Ron had disappeared earlier in the day, and Hermione was also nowhere to be found. I still followed them everywhere they went, and it was getting annoying. Harry decided to make a statement. He stood up on the top of one of the tables. Hello, Gryffindor students. I'm Harry Potter, the protector of Hogwarts, and I would like to address this scandal, as some would call it. Harry noticed Colin Creevy writing furiously on a pad of paper. His eyes were hidden behind the brim of his fedora. I call my dear friend Mud because I believe it will help take the power away from the word. If we keep avoiding terms, then we won't be able to talk anymore. Our language will fall apart. I invite you all to take the power away from the term Mudblood. Use Mudblood and Muggleborn interchangeably. After a while, it won't be a derogatory slur. The students cheered. Now that he fixed that scandal, he sat back down and continued to wait for Hedwig. The white snowy owl entered the common room carrying a white note in his beak. Harry read the note and stayed in the common room, wondering when his friends would return. Hermione came back first, carrying an envelope with a strange picture depicting a wolf and a raccoon. On the bottom was a ribbon with a sentence consisting of strange words. Vos numquam videre nobis adventum. Here, she said as she took a small card out of the package. The card had Harry's picture and personal information. The only difference is his birth date. Instead of him being 14, it said he was 17. They waited a little while to see if Ron would come back. Soon enough, he walked into the common room holding a test tube filled with golden brown syrup. It was almost opaque and acted like molasses. Ron shook some of the molasses-like contents onto two small plastic spoons. He handed one to Harry and the other to Hermione. What does this taste like? What is it? Harry asked as Hermione stared at her own spoon. A recipe I'm working on. Try it, Ron insisted. They brought the spoons to their mouths and immediately regretted it. At first it was almost tasteless, but then it gained a uniquely terrible flavor that resembled spoiled milk. The thickness made it hard to swallow and they wished they had water. Is it a recipe for death? Hermione asked with her face crinkled. Because you've got it. Does it need more sugar? Ron asked sadly. It needs a lot more than sugar, Harry said as he shook his head to try and get the taste out of his mouth. And I have a feeling a lot of the other ingredients don't belong in there. Ron took the spoons back and threw them in the garbage. How do I sign up for the Triwizard Tournament? Harry asked as they went to find water. Maybe a poster says something about it, Hermione suggested. Every hall in the castle was now covered with posters. Even the amount of Triwizard Tournament posters had increased. On each one, a sticky note had been added. Written in black ink, they read, 
Visit mad Moody. He will tell you if you're worthy. Reluctantly, they went to the wand safety classroom and found the professor refilling his flask with a bottle. When he heard them come in, he almost dropped the flask in an effort to hide the bottle. I'd like to sign up for the Triwizard Tournament, Mad Citizen, Harry said. The what? mad Moody stared at them with a blank expression. Oh! The Tournament of Triwizards! Of course! I stole the sign-up box. Ahem. <laughs> Why should I put your name in the box? Are you old enough? Yes, I am, Harry said as he showed the fake ID to mad Eye Moody. <laughs> I know it was a fake ID when me eyes sees one. Because you used to be a bobby? Hermione asked. No, because I used to use them all the time. Actually, this should be very high quality. I just knew it was fake, sis. You don't look seventeen. You look eight tops. Anyway, I likes your style. I'll put your name in the box. Well, that was easy, Ron said as they walked down the hallway on their way back to Gryffindor Tower. Did you get Hagrid's letter? Harry nodded. Yeah, he wants us to help decorate. Since they were unsure of when they would be helping Hagrid with the Yule Ball preparations and the champions of the Triwizard Tournament would be announced on the 1st of January, they had to wait to help out with the school activities. Luckily, Harry's announcement convinced several students to support him again. Ron's first Quidditch match was scheduled to begin soon, so Harry and Hermione went to the field and found a spot on the bleachers. Professor McGonagall and Lee Jordan were sitting next to them. Lee Jordan had spore-keeping equipment and a microphone since he was the Quidditch commentator. Welcome, Hogwarts, to another special Gryffindor vs. Gryffindor match. Harry and Hermione had never heard of this kind of match and were very confused. Lee continued to talk. I'd like to introduce our new cheerleading team. Pigwidgeon is leading our feathered friends and hopefully ending this blasted match. Why do we have owl cheerleaders? Hermione asked Lee. Lee pushed the mic away. Because no one's using snail mail anymore. The owls are getting depressed. And because everyone loves Pigwidgeon. Pig was having a blast. He flew around the owls and then around the crowd. He took advantage of the empty field by showing off all of his tricks. He went back to the other owls when the Quidditch players walked onto the field. McGonagall grabbed the microphone off the stand. Now's your chance! They won't suspect a thing! Sneak attack! Attack! Lee took the microphone back with a disappointed glare to McGonagall and continued commentating. The players are taking their positions. Madame Hooch blew her whistle and the game began. And they're off! Gryffindor is in possession of the Quaffle, er, one of the Gryffindor teams. Lee leaned back towards Hermione and Harry. These Gryffindor versus Gryffindor matches are torture. I'm supposed to commentate, but even I don't know what's going on. The crowd roared and Lee took the microphone. Ten points to this side of the field. He put the mic back on its stand. What's worse is that it's impossible for this match to end. How do you know for sure, citizen? Harry asked. Because this match is over three years old, and the snitch graduated last year. The only other way a match can end is if both team captains give mutual consent. Since it's the same team, there's only one captain. Why is Gryffindor fighting itself? Hermione asked. It's not a real match. The crowd cheered again, and Lee picked up the mic. Ten points for, uh, a team. He put the mic back and continued talking to Harry and Hermione. This is a tryout match that started on the first day of classes three years ago. The two Seekers got into some kind of fight and the whole match was kinda dismissed. McGonagall picked the winner of the fight for the team, citing he would quote, inflict real damage, but he never came back to finish the game. The match continued on until it was impossible to win. The Snitch started wearing t-shirts that said he was the holder of the Golden Snitch. Whoever the Seeker is, they never cared. To think. They could have just spotted him in the hall and grabbed the Golden Snitch from the Snitch. They could have held it up and basked in the applause of their peers finally laying this tryout match to rest. Harry sat silently, hoping that no one would realize he was the Seeker. Luckily, they have a substitute Seeker, so the real Gryffindor matches have ended. Sweet, glorious endings. Every time I look at the score for this match, I die a little inside. The score was too high to be kept by a traditional scoreboard, so it was written on a large whiteboard. 36,170 to 36,120. I'm starting to go mad. Every time McGonagall starts telling everyone to fight, I can't help wondering if that will stop this. Don't worry, Harry exclaimed. When I become king, I will end this match. You have my vote, Lee said. A Ravenclaw nervously walked towards Harry and Hermione. Hi, I'm Cho Chang. I think it's really brave of you to run for king of Hogwarts. Well, it's only natural for the protector of Hogwarts to want to be the king of Hogwarts, Harry said pompously. I can count on your vote, right? Yes, of course. I never liked Malfoy. I didn't believe that scandal thing a while back either. Anyway, I'd just like to say something about the frequent burglaries in Ravenclaw Tower especially. Hermione started coughing and Harry responded to Cho's inquiry. I won't say anything specific because the victim post is everywhere, but just know I will stop the larceny problem. Cho smiled. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. 
The match continued on for hours. Students left and students arrived. Some did homework and eventually left. Harry and Hermione stayed to support Ron into the night. Some of the Quidditch players had fallen asleep and a very small amount of people were watching the game. Even McGonagall got tired. She left to eat dinner and she never came back.